Okay, so these off-road lights are inoperative right now. This circuit has these four lights, that light bar, and the lights that are up there. In the mirror, it says ditch lights. And you make that simple assumption that it's LED, they don't draw that much. Did a 30 amp circuit there. And then it burnt out. It burnt a relay first, but then after I replaced the relay, the fusible link I used was obviously already burnt too. So I have my relays all right here. Um, that's the off-road lights ones. The fusible link is back here. It's not burnt out that bad, but it's obviously not powering up. So, fusible link a lot of times will bubble up and you can tell it's totally and completely done. Sometimes it just burns out and doesn't leave much of a trace. It's, it's weird that way. So I went back and looked up the literature on this stuff and looked at what they draw. None of their sales literature actually says what the amperage of them are. But you can do the calculations on that one pretty easy. There's converters all over the place. When you look at how much wattage they have versus 12 voltage and then con convert that on into your amps and you figure out 6 amps per each of these 7 inch rounds, 15 for this, and 2 for each of those pods. And I'm generally in the realm of 35 amps. And that's general. Because it's point something, 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 something. But in which way, I'm over amping this thing. So, one of these has to come off. And which one's coming off? This one. Why? Because I want this one for the S10. Notice here, one of the things I've never really been truly happy with is too much interference. I'm too tight in my clearances here. I can get this one either pointing up to the sky or pointing down to the ground. So I've got to change some things here, and it's a very simple change. I could cut that bar off and re-weld it on, but there's a simpler solution, and we'll get to that in just a second. So these have been on for a while and just inspecting the wiring on them I've got electric tape wrapped on that one that means I've got several these ones seem okay but you can see a really good example right there of what happens when the jacket is pierced that means I may have corrosion in my wiring I sliced that one off because that went up to the light bar and these are the ground legs so I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup on this wiring too while I'm at it. Some signs of rust on the brackets. But what I'm looking at is this actually ends up flexing more than I'd like. It doesn't seem to right here when you yank on it, which is why I thought it was pretty solidly built. But you can hear that resonance. So when the lights are actually on it, it actually does flex. So I need to get in there and stiffen that up just a hair. Well, I've got an idea of how to do that. I think I only need one gusset right here in the middle and that should do the trick. So a little bit of welding today but these holes because everything gets into too much interference here maybe if I'd have dropped it like an eighth of an inch if this bar had been an eighth of an inch down it may have been a, a decent enough solution but those welds are solid enough that I'm not tearing any of this apart. So the other option is lengthen these holes. So let's get to that.
really don't know how I lived most of my old adult life without air tools. Simple Husky ones from Home Depot, die grinder bits. There's so many things I've done with those since I got them. But I just want to kick those lights back a quarter of an inch or more. So now I've slotted those out. They're not the cleanest looking slot holes. That's probably the best one I did so far. That was over drilled to begin with, so that's a, a mess. But because I chose this bent C channel, even though I'm close to the edge of that, there is still a ton of strength in here because you got that second plane back on the back side there. So it should still hold pretty well so long as I put this gusset in here. When I use this plate in a vain effort to try to keep metal shards out of my winch, but I don't know, it may have been futile. I'm going to vacuum all that up and then get to putting that gusset in right there. Alright, all that time and effort making the truck look good, even though if you get close you can see some blemishes here and there. Got me a welding blanket, I'm going to protect all that front end and keep that sheet metal above the winch. I need a wider piece if I've got one, the only thing wider i got is freaking, shoot that's thick. Um... Man, I wonder if I get this stuff in smaller sheets for things like this. Hopefully, since I'm only going to be working right here, I'm going to be cutting these off, grinding that all smooth back again. Yeah, I'm cutting the tabs off. They're good tabs. There's, you know, 32 inch light bar fit here just perfectly. So that's, that's a method you could use if you got one of these trail ready bumpers. But I have another idea of something else this truck needs that will probably fit across that. Stay tuned for that. That'll be later. But yeah, let's get this ground off, get these cut off. This should protect everything, engine bay, front grill, line X, all that. I'm hoping that keeps my winch line straight. It'd suck to have to buy another winch line. Cutting, grinding, shaping. I've kind of got the piece I want. Funky looking little piece, but that's kind of the way it works. Doing it just with an angle grinder. These circular wheels, you can get curves in there. It's not perfect, but that gap will get filled by weld anyway. Kind of leads to a little bit better penetration if you have a little bit of a gap on some things like this. Roll cages and other real structural things, you don't want gaps, you want bevels, but yeah. Safety notice. My first angle grinder I ever bought had a hold, had a hold down so you could actually keep it going. As I'm going there, my grip is just getting freaking tired. It's been a rough week, I'm tired already, but those hold downs don't exist anymore. And you, you can imagine why some safety Nazi figured out that if the hold down is on, you drop this tool, you've got a party. The other thing to note too, I've been asked about this too, is how, how far down these little quarter inch discs all run. I'll run them as far as I can. These ones are divoted in, so you probably only want to run them right about there before you run out of cutting distance there. But look out for 
See that little bit of damage? It's not bad here, but if you start seeing chunks that come in significantly, toss it. Don't even risk it. People call them death wheels for a reason. That stuff explodes, you can end up with a freaking penetration wound. A chunk of this sticking in your flesh would not be fun. Not a good ER trip. But that that's not bad to me. Others might throw it away right there, but if you have as the abrasive chunks out or cracks, toss the wheel. Otherwise, I run it down until I have nothing left. Stuff's expensive anyway. Other versions are straight up flat, so you can go even farther. And those same thing, quarter inch discs. But safety notice about that one. These ones obviously no more hold down on these things, which just kinda irritates me because I used to like you doing that because it's easier to grip and hold the, the grinder. I used the flap wheel after the grinder to clean all this up. And that flap wheel is sweet. It helps you smooth everything out from the grinder marks. The grinder marks are very, very rough. Yes, I've got some divots from where I cut on both sides, too. That's how good I am. But I'm not worried about that because of what's going to come here next. Um, and I don't know when I'm going to do that. That'll be in a future video. But I have, I have a plan for these two points. And it should work out pretty nicely. All right, let's get into here. I was looking at where this piece fits. Ooh, still kind of warm. Ooh, very much warm. So see it fits. I've got it midway between these two lines. I cut it down so I don't have any interference, but it should be enough to really stiffen this thing up. I got to grind away a little bit more of the powder coating. It's kind of a shame because this is really good powder coating. Well, I got lights rubbing through on that powder coating. I hadn't seen that before. Same here. So I'll just play with the, try to get more of a gap on that so I don't do that in the future. And I'll probably spritz that with some of my paint. It's burned in, funky little piece of steel, but it, ooh, still hot. It stiffens that stuff up pretty dang good. I don't know if you can tell I'm shaking the camera more than I am the truck. Decent welds for my abilities. You can see why I put that steel there. Look how much spall would have fallen onto my winch rope. Don't want that happening. So definitely had that piece of steel there for a reason. Scuffed up a little bit with a red scotch Brite pad. See what I got here. I'm just going to go grab some paint and some primer and I'll hit this thing up, let it dry.
out. I got those back on, which you saw me doing with my beautiful little air grinder there, the air die grinder, is slotting these holes that are down in there so that I can drop these down just another eighth of an inch, and now they fit nicely in here. One of the things I'm noticing, you see that does move. That is not anything to do with my steel. That's the rubber isolators that are on these things. So very well built. I got them as tight as I can, but those isolators still allow movement, which means it's not going to be taking up any vibration, or it isolates it from vibration, because this is tied directly to the frame. So that's not a bad idea at all. And then the next step of this thing to getting it working, I don't know how much you can see on this, but this fusible ink's done for. It's certainly bloated and kind of burnt up. You can kind of see it just in this section here mainly. There, yeah, a little bit of burn mark in there, but it gets bloated in here. And that's what they do when they burn up. Now, the thing with fusible links and why you'd want to use them is they can handle more power than a fuse can, but they will still burn up if you have a problem. If you start digging into your factory wiring, you'll find fusible links all over the place. That's the way the factory usually does it. You can get this stuff in rolls. But I usually just get the, the little kit from Little Fuse. You get them at your favorite auto parts store. But to get these things working again, I think that's all I got to do is uh, just get this thing replaced. So yeah, it takes a little bit more than just flipping a fuse in and out of there, but for the kind of power you're running with all these lights, and again, I kind of have deleted the whole light bar up here, sitting down over there. Well, let's get to it. All right, there it is. We've got those lights back on and working. That should bring the entire circuit back down to 30 amps. It's less than actually, but it's a 30 amp relay on there. That should keep things going. And with those four 85 watts of LEDs, 5,000 lumens, that should be just fine. But yeah, got it all working. Just replace that fusible link, replace the relay. Now for the next phase. All right, got the other off-road lights all stripped off, figured out the wiring. Huh, now, what I had in mind, this light bar goes basically center to center of where the KC lights were mounted, but there's no way I'm getting enough purchase and still leaving enough room back there using those light tabs, which is fine because those tabs can be used for other things later. So I'm going to have to fab up my own tabs. I was hoping I had more room than I do. But that's all good. I'll get it done.
of times you'll see guys use cardboard and all kinds of stuff. Me, I'm kind of just a shape as I go kind of guy. You see just out of that strap material there, I've got two decently close together. You know, I didn't weld them together and ground them down perfectly, but they will work for what I need them to do. It's funny if you look at them. I mean, the holes are in the same place. But they're slightly off. I could mess with that if I wanted to, but for what these are, I am not going to. For this bumper is oh, a year or two more and it's gone. But now I'm going to take these, weld them in around here, so they'll sit in there. Maybe have a little bit more gap there than I wanted, but I'll fill it with weld. It'll be fine. But I'm going to use what's left of the old light tabs and it should make a pretty good strong connection for this thing gives you two planes kind of like an angle iron should work out just fine Alright, if you're here in Utah, you know exactly how cold it has been. And you can rightfully count out or point out that that is not exactly ideal weather for painting. But again, this is not a bumper I expect to last very long. I just want to keep a little bit of the rust at a minimum. I built this bumper a long, long time ago. I'd like to think my welding capabilities have improved since then. But two things I'm counting on. One, the cans I soaked in hot water for about 20-30 minutes. Hottest water I can get out of the sink. So they were pretty warm. Two, that metal was still hot. So it should be just fine for curing that up. I think while I'm here, I'm going to get to another welding project. There's what's going on top of the bumper. So let's get that one done too.
All right, there we go. It's wired up. I just got to tuck those wires away and zip tie them. Got a nice big light bar up front. Kind of a sleeker look for the truck. Over here, what you saw me use, a couple of these all-thread connectors give me enough standoff off the top of this to be able to mount the high lift style jack. I mean, it's not the name brand of high lift. It's what I got from Tractor Supply. What is their name? Bulldog? Anyway. So I can mount it there, bolt it down with a couple of those. Now, because this was hot and because I heated up all the paint, I think it should stick long enough. It should stick long enough for me. I'm not really, really worried about it too much because eventually I will dismount this entire bumper and give it a Raptor liner coating. All right, there it is, all bolted up. A pair of bolts here, one there and one here. Should keep it nice and secure. I've got room to reach under here to be able to get my hood latch. I am curious. That light bar whistled a lot sitting right here and I could hear it from inside the truck. If the music wasn't loud or the windows are down, will this whistle? I'm curious. I did get one of these nice rubber isolator boots to keep things nice and rattle free. Boy, they did not do a good job putting that sticker on. I may strip it off anyway. It's not very centered on the truck, but weight wise, I've got most of the weight sitting over the big spar and a little bit out there. So that's actually what I was really looking for is all the weight right over there over the big upward spar. Should do the trick for me. Now I've got a high lift jack for the truck. Wonder if a 48 inch one's enough or if I need to go get a 60 for this truck, but it should be all right. I also picked up while I was there at Tractor Supply a nice base plate for that same thing for when you're in sand or other soft, soft terrain. And a nice come along that I've been needing for a long time for alternate recovery methodologies. But yeah, I think I'm all set. Picked up some stuff, tire repair kit and an inflator at uh, Homey Depot. I think basically I am ready to load this truck up and go to Moab. And yeah, that's what we're doing for Thanksgiving. So I'm going to tuck all that wiring away, get that all zip tied away nice and neat, and then I'm done for this. If you come this far, appreciate you watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.